High stakes issues, deep partisan divides in many places, that's a recipe for gridlock. But here at TVO, it's become the formula for a fascinating and original new television series called Political Blind Date. It premieres tonight right after this program. And to get you set up for it, we're taking a look behind the scenes with Mark Johnston. He's one of the executive producers of the show. And the two politicians who take the leap in the first episode, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, that's him on the left. He's the Liberal MP for Beaches East York. And Garnet Jenis, he is the Conservative MP for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, in Alberta. On the right, I guess we've appropriately put you geographically and politically where you're supposed to be. Well, he's to the left of me. Uh, only if you look this way. <laughs> uh, it's good of you two Follow guys to join us here on the program. <clears throat> Mark, good to see you again. Uh, Empire of the Word was the last time you were here. Yes. Great documentary series you did for us many, many years ago. Tell us about what your initial vision was for this series. Well, it's it really a couple of people, a partner in this project. His name is Tom Powers. He saw a series of short articles, really transcripts of coffee dates of British politicians before the 2015 general election. And that was really the, the beginning of an idea. He came to me and my partner, Amanda Handy, at Nomad Films. And together, um, we began to map out something bigger. He said, do you think there's an idea here? And I said, oh, there's something way bigger than just a coffee date. And then we started to think, could we take themes, issues that matter to Canadians, put two politicians together, have them go on two sides of a blind date and try to influence each other. The key to the whole series, of course, is getting the right pairings and then getting them to agree to come on. Did, did you not think that would be impossible? No. Well, I, I'm usually I'm not a person that you know, listens to people when they say something can't be done. And we knew that this would be challenging to get people together. Um, I made a film many years ago about Al-Qaeda recruiters for another network. And it was easier to schedule Al-Qaeda recruiters in hiding to get interviews with them <laughs> than to book two days with two busy politicians. That's, well, that's why I asked the question. All right, let's get to these two busy politicians. I'm curious as to why you two agreed to say yes in the first place. Nathan. Uh, well, one, uh, it's an important topic, and I think it's, uh, it's relevant for Canadians to be discussing this now and as, we, uh, as our government is looking to legalize and regulate. Uh, and second, uh, one reason I got into politics in the first place is this uh, distrust people might have in politicians, and we repeat the same talking points, or that's the view of it. Uh, and to enter into a world and be part of a program that tries to get beyond that, I think, is how we ought to reflect ourselves to Canadians. We should just point out that the issue that you two disagree on is whether to legalize marijuana, and you are in favor, and you are opposed, and the program takes us through both sides of the debate as you feel them. Why did you decide to agree to do this? Well, part of it is the issue as well. It's an important issue, and I, I think that uh, uh, oftentimes when I've debated this issue before, uh, especially younger people may not have actually heard the, the, the arguments in favor of uh, continuing something not exactly but similar to the current system. Um, so the opportunity to get those arguments out there and have a good dialogue about that. Uh, more fundamentally, though, uh, I really believe in the importance of genuine, authentic debate. I think that uh, you can change people's minds some of the time. Uh, but in any event, there's value in the exercise of digging deeper, getting an appreciation of maybe the experiences that lead to different points of view. Uh, so it's, it's the kind of exercise that I think we need more of in politics, genuine debate framed through experiences and exposure to, to d direct things that are happening out in the and world. And one of the things we're not going to do on this program is give away the ending, as right. in okay. you know, who may <laughs> have moved how many degrees and who right. else's direction. We're just going to let that play itself out. But I, I wonder, I mean, I don't think I'm going out on a limb to say that there, there have been times in the past of this country where being seen fraternizing with somebody from another party could get you in a whole heap of trouble. And we've all got lots of stories about how and when that was the case. Did you have to get approval from the Prime Minister's office to do this? Did they try to talk you out of it? How difficult was it to, like, answer some of those questions? Uh, I just said yes. I mean, I, I, there was no pushback from the center. Uh, had there been, but, you know, I think we've promised to be uh, different. And I, I, on this, I certainly felt that way, that there was no indication, don't do this, stick to these talking points, and here are your key messages. You got none of that. I, they would have been in the recycling bin had I received them, but I, I did not receive them. How about you? 
So we have a process where you, you keep people informed of what you're doing. Obviously, that's that's pretty standard. I assume other parties had the same. But but at no point in the process did anyone tell me that, that they didn't want me doing this. I was... Uh, or try to full, influence full, what you would say? Uh, no, no. I mean, we, we got... Uh, obviously, you know, you, you want to get a bit of a sense of, of where everybody's thinking is on the topic. Um, but I have my own views on this issue. This is an issue that I've spoken about before I was elected, and uh, I was pretty consistent with... with uh, articulating that perspective. Okay. Show. Mark, let's just go through, if we can, the essential format for how every program rolls out, right? You introduce the two MPs or politicians, whatever, and essentially their job over the next half hour is to do what? Well, you follow them from the point at which they start before the date. So let's say they're at home getting ready. And I think in the case of both of these gentlemen, we're th with their families, they're getting ready. We hear who they are. And then we actually film them with two different cameras as they come together. We ask the politicians, what do you know of the other person? What do you think about their position on the issue? And then they meet, let's say, for about an hour. And they talk about if, if they don't know each other very well, and, and you two knew something about each other, but I think there were surprises about your families and whatnot. And then halfway through that get together, you switch to the issue. They begin to debate it. At the end of that hour, one of the two of them says, now we're going to go and meet some people, go to some places, and I'm going to show you things I want you to see to help influence how you see the issue. And then the next day, the second day, the other person says, I've got some things to show you. You're coming with me. It's the same in every show. And at the end, we hear whether they might have influenced each other, whether they like each other, whether they're going to have a drink together next time, or smoke a joint in this case. <laughs> Tell me this, how well did uh, Gar how well did you know him before you went on television with him? So we filmed about six months ago. As I recall, I mean, we'd had some cursory interactions. Yeah. And uh, one of the, the challenges with the way our lives are on, on Parliament Hill is there's, there's always so much going on uh, that in, in the midst of the, the regular day-to-day -day in Ottawa, there just aren't a whole lot of opportunities. Um, yeah, you're not the same caucus. There's no reason why you would bump into each other. At yeah. various, I mean, it's 338 of you outside up there. Outside of so. committee, outside of mm. parliamentary travel, yeah. there's mm. not, there aren't that many opportunities, frankly, to get together with people from the other side of the aisle. So fair to say you barely knew each other. Yeah, yeah that's, I think that's we had one exchange on C14 in the House, but, but you yeah. know, what not was C14? the euthanasia. Oh, so we had some, some, some back and forth on some topics, and I know Nate and I are both people that are fairly active in House debate, but, uh, but it was really through this experience that we got to... to go a bit deeper and, and spend some time together. Would, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth here, but are you friends now? Yeah. So I would say y y yes, I in, ter in, in, ter in terms of, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, like we, we haven't hung out necessarily subsequent to outside of the house, um, but uh, subsequent to that, we had an important debate on the Rohingya genocide, and that's an, an area we completely agree on, and, and we were able to, he was someone I, could I knew to immediately cross the aisle and, and speak to about. So it helps having uh, a relationship going forward in Ottawa, I think. I mean, in some yeah, respects, sure. you have, you, I mean, you're 33, yeah. you're 30, you're yeah. both parents, you're both, like, unusually young to be members of parliament, so you, you already have that in common. Yeah. He is uh, a left-leaning, white wine-sipping, sm pot-smoking, downtown <laughs> Toronto elitist, you know, Other than white wine, man. Yeah, okay, maybe that. <laughs> and you're one of these, you know, rural, right-wing, redneck from Western. Okay, so well, I, I'm I, vegan, I, so it's even worse. Yeah. And you're a vegan, which is worse. <laughs> well. So I can see why there might be some difficulty finding common ground here. Did you find that to be the I, case? I mean, obviously, you're walking through the stereotypes yes. for effect, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, we 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 found in in discussion. I mean, we have. Uh, we, we do have a, a fair bit in common demographically. Even my, my wife uh, practices medicine. She does environmental medicine, and she's got a great deal of interest in health and nutrition. And, yeah, and my Nate's wife, wife is nutrition a nutrition. George Brown's a, a chef oh. and focused on that. So there, there are right. So there and uh, my wife actually grew up in in Burlington in this area. And uh, so I mean, mine grew up in small town southwestern Ontario. Right. So maybe so. the point is our wives <laughs> our go. wives are more similar than we are. Maybe, but but. Uh, but, but I, I think, look, there's a, there's a great deal of diversity of experience across this country. Um, that, that wouldn't surprise anyone. And we've got pretty different perspectives on some issues, similar perspectives on others. As, as Nate mentioned, the, the Rohingya issue, but, but other issues, I think we'd have a common outlook on a lot of questions around international human rights. Um, so there's similarities disagree, and differences. I think there's a, a similarity to the approach in, in treating politics. With, uh, so question period, I think, skews people's view of politics uh, generally. And uh, 
The fact of the matter is we should have more thoughtfulness in politics. And while I disagree often with uh, Garnett, I would say I, I hope that I bring that degree of thoughtfulness at times, and, and, I, and I think he does as well. And so I think there's a seriousness in treating the policy issues of the day that uh, we could agree on. Even if we might disagree on the substance of it, we're we try to reasonably yeah. disagree, I think, rather than shout at each other. So these two were debating cannabis, how and whether to legalize mm -hmm. and so on. But this is not the only conversation you're having over the course of your first season. What other issues no, are you getting there, your teeth in? There are in? a number of them. And I just wanted to say quickly, <laughs> In casting them, you know, I knew that they were having a debate on this issue at the University of Ottawa, at the law school. And I went to Ottawa to see the two of them have that debate. And for me, that was the moment where I knew this could be a great show. We'd already talked to, to Nate, and he'd said yes, and I came up to talk to Garnett. And I think we talked for 30 seconds, and you said, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was it. You know, there are a number, well, we have a transit episode with Jugmeet Singh and Doug Ford which I think people are looking forward I've seen to. It. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy good. Yeah. We have an episode on supervised injection sites with Giorgio Mamaliti, the Toronto councillor, and Matt Brown, the mayor of London. Very interesting. Includes a trip to Vancouver, not to give away too much. Mm -hmm. In that episode, we have one on corrections on prisons in Ontario, and that is the Minister of Corrections, uh, which is Marie-France Lalonde, with Sherry DeNovo, the NDP MPP from Parkdale High, High Park. So you can... Very interesting episode as well. And then um, we have one on housing with Adam Vaughn um, and Maria Ajameri, the counselor from North York, mm -hmm. who, who lived in public housing. So very interesting perspective. And the last one will be on the environment and carbon taxes and cap and trade, which is Arthur Potts, the uh, MPP from the same riding, a, a colleague of yours, um, who is the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change with Shannon Stubbs, friend of yours and colleague of yours. Riding, yeah. yeah, so an oil patch um, conservative MP. And so the two of them will explore carbon taxes. And I just wanted to say about persuading people to do the show, I talked to Shannon, who agreed to do the show, and I said, oh, you must have talked to Garnett, your colleague and your friend. And she said, no, I talked to Nathaniel Erskine-Smith. And and he said, you should do it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't know if I convinced her to do it, but uh, my advice to her was uh, they treated Garnett more fairly than they should have. So, <laughs> so, uh, so you, you should feel safe. <laughs> and that I don't agree do. on that either. You know, that's, <laughs> that's uh, I'm sure, I'm sure Garnett was saying We're off to the races disagreeing, so that's, <laughs> that's what we want, I guess. I think one of the things that we need a better understanding of is how open to persuasion by the other one's arguments were you when you started this? Because my experience with politicians is they don't start debates open-minded at all. They start debates intent on you know, putting forward their position and demanding that the other guy come their way. So, okay, start us off. Uh, so, uh, on many topics where I would consider myself uh, less informed or learning the subject, I, I would approach it with, a, I think, maybe a greater openness. This, where I truly feel our decades-long war on drugs, including on cannabis, uh, is an abject failure and is unjust. Uh, and I've done a lot of research reading, and uh, uh, so I came probably more prepared to try and convince Garnett. But what I found very useful was uh, there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there about cannabis. There's a lot of, in the debate on both sides, there, there is a lot of uh, attacking and sticking to talking points. And for Garnett and I to really get at the crux of the disagreement, uh, which is about whether Canadians can responsibly use the substance. But getting it at the crux of the disagreement in a reasonable way over the course of a couple of days, I found very useful. But I think, the, 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 to cut to the chase there, you think you know this brief so well, you really were not open to persuasion by anything he had to say. I was open to uh, evidence. I mean, that's the nature of the job. But I definitely came more prepared to to knock him down with the evidence I had. OK, Garnett, your view? Uh, I, so I, I think, in, in principle, the idea that people are sort of more open to persuasion on topics that they haven't thought a lot about already is, is true. Nate and I have presumably had this same conversation with many people in our lives up to yeah. this point already. Yeah. It was unlikely that Nate was going to bring an argument to me that I hadn't heard from somebody somewhere uh, before. I hope that, that we were able to at least expose each other to some of the realities of the other perspective, kind of force each other out of that straw man position at the very least. But was there ever a moment in the discussion where you thought to yourself, ooh, he made a good point there, but I can't let him have it. Can't be seen on camera to be agreeing with that. <laughs> well, 
I, so I, I don't know that either of us made points that the other had not heard before. So I think Nate made good points, uh, but you know, this is again, if, if we had been debating some totally brand new issue. Uh, it, it might have been more likely that there would have been sort of those surprises in conversation. So I, think, I think you did a good job, I mean, insisting on the potential harms associated with cannabis use and insisting on that, uh, pointing to the evidence of potential harms. And then uh, I, I'm not going to disagree. You know, the, the National Academy of Sciences has a review from January of earlier this year that sets out potential harms in the literature review uh, of the evidence. But then it's a question of how do you respond to the potential harms? How do you best regulate them? How do you best ensure that we're limiting the potential harms without unduly restricting yeah. Canadians' freedom? Now, so. knowing that you've got essentially one shot both to convince him or at least to lay out a path for him to see, and, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of people on television or online, et cetera, as well, I presume you had to think long and hard about where you were going to take him for your political blind date. Uh, Did you? Yeah, I mean, the goal, I think, was to, so we visited a, a facility where, an incredibly professional facility. Um, I don't think, I'd certainly never seen that many plants. I'm not sure, uh, Garnet, I, I would expect you perhaps had not. Um, but, it's in uh, uh, Smith Falls, I'm In sure. Smith Falls at, at the Tweed facility. And, and so I think showing that uh, the market can easily move outside of the shadow, or out of the shadows, that uh, the black market uh, has been uh, a terrible way of doing things, and there is a professional way of doing things, and out in the open with full transparency and oversight, uh, and that regulation can work, I think was an important way to frame the issue. How did you decide yeah. what you were going to do to introduce him on your blind date? And, and uh, what we were able to expose uh, Nate to, a few different things that I think were, were valuable in, in creating that, um, that perspective. We went to kind of the other end of professionalism when it comes to um, the, the, the marijuana industry. Uh, it was a, an illegal dispensary where there was a lot of, I think, very obviously misinformation. Uh, there was one person we interacted with who had some kind of a, a title that involved a wellness consultant or something who had, who had no formal training and was talking about how she smoked marijuana uh, in pregnancy mm -hmm. on purpose because she thought it was better for her children. You didn't seem too impressed with that. No, I, I was. And, and I think Nate was more composed in the moment, but, but he he saw the problems with that. And I, Which is an interesting so, point, because we can, we can look at, we can identify that as a problem. I'm going to agree that that is a problem. You're not going to defend that. But, uh, but the answer is regulation and education, right? And so that's, what, that's ultimately where we're going to disagree is, yes, there are some potential problems, but the answer can't possibly, yeah. a cop knocking on my door on a Friday night and Garnett's having a scotch and I've got my vaporizer and I get a ticket. Well, that, in, that's, in, that's crazy. In, 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 terms of, in terms of the date, I, and it, it didn't make the show, there's a lot of good content in the show, but, but we had a brief conversation at the end uh, with someone involved in, in law enforcement, police chief in, in Smith's Falls. And it, one of the sort of long running debates through the show was what are the harms associated with it being illegal. I think it was valuable for us to, to learn specifically from this police chief about their strategy for approaching this, which, which, which isn't to, to use the heavy hand of the law in, in, in every case or even anywhere near most cases, um, but it was to try and uh, recognize that the law can be a tool in the broader toolbox of a public health approach that seeks to make sure people are aware of the risks and uh, avoiding taking on that, that harm to themselves. Well, I have to say you two seem reasonably comfortable even when put into circumstances that were not of your choosing for example yeah. when he took you to that plant in Smith Falls vice versa when he introduced you to some people who've been you know through considerable harm as a result of their drug use you both handled that I thought pretty well I want to find out from the boss of the show were there any other politicians that got put in any set of circumstances where you watching this thought to my thought to yourself "Ooh, they are really not happy being here right now Doug Ford on a bicycle <laughs> for the first time in 30 years. Yeah, yeah. There, there were a, there were a number of those events that happened, and 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 well, we want those events to happen, making the show, but we want to do it in a safe environment, and I think that was important to tell these two and everybody else, and let you know as we work that you're this is not gotcha journalism. There's nothing la like that going on, and that we're putting you in a safe environment. I think. In taking Matt Brown to the downtown east side it's the with, Georg with Giorgio, the mayor of London, uh, with Giorgio Mammoliti to the downtown east side and, uh, and being accosted by people on the street and, and talking to them, probably a relatively uncomfortable moment. Or Marie-France Lalonde, you know, meets with somebody who had an unfortunate uh, journey in the correction system here, is confronted with that person 
uh, directly, which a minister would not no normally be exposed to. So those moments happen. I, I got to tell you, when I watched the uh, Jagmeet Singh Doug Ford episode, I, I gave Doug Ford an enormous amount of credit for really going into his non-comfort zone. I mean, this guy is hardly what you'd call a cycling advocate, right? I mean, he's been railing against the war on the car for many, many years. Have we got that clip ready? Let's, let's just let's show a little snippet of this, and then we'll come back and chat. Go ahead, Sheldon, roll the clip. I haven't been on a bike in 35 years. No way. 35 years. That's what he said. He hadn't touched a bike in over three decades. So we're going to go from where it's like really difficult because yeah. there's no real protection, yeah. and then you're going to find where it's protected, how much easier and more relaxed you're going to feel. OK. These are some bikes. Yeah. They are City of Toronto, as you know. Yeah, a waste and, of money. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're a great way to get oh, around, no, great bikes, but they're a waste of money. You'll see people ride them even in the winter. It's great. Way, what? Hey, I'm not around. against them. These are the death mobiles we're going on. We'll be good. Hey, buddy, I better take a spin around. I haven't yeah, that's biked right. in 35 try, years. Try, try this. Uh, Holy Christ. Yeah, once it's like riding it. a bike, right? You once it. you learn. <laughs> Uh, again, full kudos to him for being prepared to put himself in that kind of circumstance. But uh, I want to ask you, as the producer, mm -hmm. are you secretly hoping he wipes out somewhere along the way? Come on, be honest now. <laughs> no, I hope he goes on the whole journey because Drug Meat wants to show him unprotected areas, fully protected lanes. You want the whole story to play out. You want to see whether his mind has changed, then I guess you'll have to see the episode to find out whether... Indeed, but are, 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 you, are you sitting here telling us that there wasn't one moment during the course of all this when Doug Ford is riding his bicycle on a street that is not protected by a specific bite lane, and you're not secretly hoping, oh, I wonder if somebody bumps into him here. That'd make excellent no, television. No, but I, but I will give away that he was in an unsafe place on Bathurst Street, and he, you know... We all felt it. Yeah, and he you could felt see it, it too. And he felt it. Yeah. So, so the, the, you know, maybe that was the most dangerous <laughs> moment, or the most unsafe moment in the series, but, but uh, in general, always safe. Most unsafe Good. moment, other than when the people at the dispensary were coming after us, right? That was. Uh, you didn't drink the tea, though, so you right. Yeah, that, <laughs> that would have been very. It's, it's interesting, yeah. though, um, you know, watching the episode of us and just seeing some of the clips. Um, you worry, you know, you mentioned gotcha journalism. You do worry as a politician going on spending a couple of days, what's going to make it, what's, gonna, what's not going to make it. We visited with uh, someone who has uh, had a, an addiction or dependence on cannabis and suffered as a result of that. But uh, what didn't make it, put, putting it point to him, do you think prohibition is the answer? Do you think regula regulation and education? He said, no, I don't think prohibition is an effective solution. That didn't make um, the cut. That didn't make the cut, unfortunately. But I, I get it having watched it because there's so much to fit in and mm -hmm. the focus on the human interest side of things actually makes the show what it is as much as the debate about cannabis. Did either and, and one of you... It's not mutually exclusive, right? That you can have a, an, an education approach that still, uh, you know, involves a ticketing option as part mm -hmm. of enforcement. But... Did either one of you seek or demand the right to have a final say over the editing of the show? No. No. Neither one of you sought it. And you were not prepared to offer it, I presume. Never. <laughs> and, 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 and no one in the show has asked for it. Everyone... And I, I don't... I think everybody understood what this experiment was going to be. And, and it's been really heartening to know that everybody's trusted us as a team. And, and I hope that everyone will see that we've treated everyone fairly. These two have seen the show. And I think you both think... It. And it's funny. This is an important thing to say. Substantial issues examined, and yet laughs. With a smile. With a La smile. Laughs on a yeah. personal level as they interact mm -hmm. and everyone in the show. I want to play something that actually is not going to bring a smile to anybody's face right now, and this mm -hmm. is not from your uh, wonderful television program, but this is a guy both of you knew. This is Arnold Chan, uh, who is the recently deceased Liberal Member of Parliament for Scarborough Agent Court. And the reason we play this clip is it will set up a discussion that I think your show tries to get at, which is the notion that... It just can't be all uh, cut and thrust all the time. There's got to be some room in politics for rational conversation. And here's how Arnold uh, absolutely memorably got that point across on the floor of the House of Commons. Roll the clip, please. I wanted to get back to, I think, a more fundamental issue, one that has been raised a number of substantive times in this House, and, and that is how we compart ourselves. And 
I'm not sure how many more times I will have the strength to get up and do a 20-minute speech in this place. But the point I, I want to impart upon all of us, I, I know that we are all honorable members. I know you revere this place. I, I would beg us to not only be, act as honorable members, but to treat this institution honorably. And sadly, a few months later, he was dead. Um, that message of a little more civility in politics, I wonder if part of the reason you agreed to participate in this show, Nate, was to demonstrate that it's actually possible. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there are moments that Canadians won't see, uh, whether it's the trips or the committee work where people are getting along. And the message we seem to want to deliver as parliamentarians from question period to scrums is stay on message, can't possibly give the other side any credit whatsoever. And I think that over time undermines the enterprise of, of, of uh, building trust in democracy. And so um, a show like this, okay, is it going to solve everything? No, but if it gives, gives any sense that we're willing to work across the aisle, that we're willing to move past uh, the key message and actually have a conversation, I think it's a good thing. How much mindless partisanship, mindless partisanship, is there still in public life in this country? I, I think there's there's still too much. I think there's, frankly, there's always going to be too much this side of heaven. I, I think what this show helps us do is is see that that one can't avoid sort of the two extremes, right? I think sometimes we see mindless partisanship, which is people saying, you know, my party right or wrong. If the same behavior happens in both parties, I'm going to call it out on the other guys and defend it on my side. Uh, that's the sort of mindless partisanship. Sometimes we see, on the other hand, kind of a, a mindless nonpartisanship, where people say, let's just hold hands and sing and pretend like we don't actually disagree, um, and everyone should agree with me in the name of nonpartisanship. Um, you don't want that either. We don't want that either. I, th I think what we want is a thoughtful commitment to issues and principles that leads us to uh, really have that intense debate some of the time when it matters, and to stand together and fight for things we both believe in uh, when we can do that as well. A, a thoughtful partisanship and nonpartisanship that's based on a commitment to ideas. You have actually captured some attention thus far in your relatively young political career for voting against your own party from time to time. From time to time. Uh, any consequences to doing that? Uh, no consequence. I mean, the hardest part, frankly, of doing it is not uh, disagreeing with the government, as it were, because the government has said so or has threatened any punishment of any sort. I mean, we, one of the promises I made at, at Doors uh, in the election was that I was here to represent the community I grew up in and, and live with my wife and uh, that it was going to be representing these views and I was going to be their advocate. Um, and so I t take that seriously and, and we made that commitment as a party. So more free votes and they are free votes. Um, what can make it difficult sometimes is just the uh, impact you might have on your colleagues. So if you know, it is a team sport it in many ways, sport. and yep. so if I'm standing up and colleagues want to stand up as well but aren't doing so, it, it might uh, it, it create some discomfort in their writings perhaps. And that's always in the back of your mind. It's not necessarily the center and pleasing the center, but really not upsetting the team too much. Have you had occasion to vote against your caucus yet? I have, yeah. And? Yeah, not as frequently as, as Nate does. I'd say I'd say Nate occasionally votes with his party on things. You know, but, uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I'm a big baseball fan. I played baseball uh, throughout my life uh, into university, and I would say you know I dis I've disagreed with the party maybe. 10, 11, 12, I don't know what, around that percentage. So my batting average is still excellent. <laughs> 900 batting yeah, average. I'm still, <laughs> the I'm, whole thing. I, yeah, I'm very good. <laughs> I, my batting average is very good as far as being yeah. a team player. Sometimes and, those and, whips <laughs> won 1,000%. Though. Yeah, yeah. They do. Yeah, oh, no, they I've, do. I've, uh, I had many conversations sitting on the couch of the whips office. <laughs> I got a minute left here, Mark. Let me give it to you to talk about, at the end of the day, what are your hopes for this series? Well, we hope people watch. We hope people believe in what these two gentlemen are saying. Uh, there needs to be a kind of thoughtful partisanship, and and I, I just hope that people see that as human beings, politicians can meet, discuss issues that are important to Canadians, and maybe influence each other, but also just get to know each other a little bit better. It's why we started this. It was the initial thought. And so far, so good. I have to tell you, it's excellent. I've seen two of your first season episodes so far, so congratulations to you for getting it done. Congratulations to you two for participating. It is a real mark for 
collegiality that we love to see in public life a little bit more. I want to say, uh, I guess we can break this news here. There will be a season two, so congratulations. And we have a challenge for you viewers out there. Tell us which politicians you would like Mark to feature for season two of Political Blind Date. You can send us your suggestions on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Send them to us. We'll make sure Mark gets them, and you never know. Season two of Political Blind Date might just be on its way to happening as we speak. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us tonight here on TVO. That was terrific. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.